Deep learning could expedite the next AI winter. Now, deep learning is the most important advancement in machine learning as a technology, but it could be inadvertently expediting the next major wave of disillusionment of machine learning. Welcome to the Dr. Data Show. This is Eric Siegel, and in this episode, I'll cover four ways in which deep learning is actually increasing the hype to value ratio of machine learning. Now, deep learning unquestionably is a major breakthrough that provides new capabilities to machine learning, more sophisticated models that can do a better job at larger scale tasks or solve better, bigger classification problems, for example. Um, No doubt about that, but it's inadvertently creating phenomena that I believe contributes to the low rate of successful deployment. That is to say, there's an increase in fixation on the technology, decreasing the relative but very much needed fixation on value so these things don't actually get to deployment. So let's talk about deep learning for a minute, why it's important, um, the advancement, what it actually enables um, that's above and beyond prior machine learning methods. And then we'll cover those four reasons that it's actually increasing the hype to value ratio. You know, so in a nutshell, deep learning um, can take larger inputs. The model can take a larger input. It's a more sophisticated neural network. It's deep. They call it deep because it's got more layers, um, more layers of networks in the actual model itself. And therefore, it can do more sophisticated transformations. It's got a higher capability as far as taking a large input So in a nutshell, it can solve more complex problems that have a big input for each individual case, so an entire high-resolution image. So in in that sense, it can sort of more directly handle signal processing than traditional machine learning methods like decision trees and log linear regression, or even ensembles thereof, where you're going to have some limit on the size of the input. Right, You might have a few dozen or even a few hundred inputs, but you're not going to have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands as you do with a high-resolution image that can go directly into a neural network, today's neural networks, otherwise known as deep, deep learning uh, neural networks. Um, so that's really important. That's really si- significant. That means the automation of machine learning. And <laughs> it's Just like any other use of a computer, it's to automate. And what we're automating in this case is the learning. And more of that learning, essentially, is automated. More is left to the learning method. And that's often referred to as feature engineering. So with traditional machine learning, uh, you you need to do a lot of work preparing the input data and engineering the features, engineering the individual variables or inputs that go into the model. So, for example, if you were going to try to do something related to image processing with something like log linear regression, something that takes uh, a more limited number of inputs, those inputs had better be well thought out, planned and engineered, and somehow extracted from the original source input, the, the original full resolution image, for example. Now, it's essentially automating the feature extraction, and that is not only better because you can do more projects without as much human input and human work, but also potentially it's it's actually doing a better job than anything we could think of as far as a manually engineering these features. So all of a sudden, with the advent of deep learning, we get it to do a great job with very high um, precision and confidence each time it tries to classify whether an image is a picture of a cat or a dog, whether it's got a traffic light somewhere in the image. Of course, that alludes to helping with self-driving, uh, whether there's a disease to diagnose in a medical image, what word is being uttered in raw audio signal input. Um, so it's handling this kind of stuff better. And this is, in a way, the holy grail of supervised learning. Now, just because we have achieved a higher level of supervised learning, that doesn't mean we get more towards so-called AI as far as whatever intelligence means and general common sense reasoning. It's still supervised. It requires labeled data, either historically accumulated, so you don't have to manually label, but we know how things turned out. This turned out to be fraudulent. This customer turned out to, to cancel or manually labeled for a lot of the image processing examples. <clears throat> um, and in fact, um, Back in the early 90s, 
my friend Alex Chafee and I were sort of working on a genetic programming approach that we had in mind the same kind of thing. We wanted to be able to throw at the model the raw image, which we only were doing a 20 by 10 matrix, binary matrix, the board of playing the game Tetris. But we weren't simply trying to solve the problem Tetris. We were trying to see whether the framework would work general purpose framework where it just took the raw input and didn't know anything about the particular game. It just knows the end end score. So how would you sort of rove around that 10 by 20 matrix and hopefully it would figure out a process and that the whole framework would be scalable to much larger inputs. And and other people like Astro Teller back then were working on similar um, things with genetic programming, trying to get it to scale. Um, So here we are many years later and all of a sudden they're doing exactly the kind of stuff we were looking at. Hey, wow. You know, we're not just finding if-then rules in a decision tree to classify customers, and we're not just finding weights in a relatively simple linear sum or something a little more advanced log linear regression. We're actually automating all aspects of a big, hairy mathematical formula, which is a multi-layer neural network, so that it can take as input, you know, the entire raw, uh, full high-resolution image and determine is there a cat somewhere in this image and where is it? Um, and, and that's, that is just remarkable. I mean, um, back when I was teaching uh, neural networks as part of the machine learning course at Columbia university, uh, I did that the first time fall of 97. Um, you know, the basic words of wisdom back then was neural networks are valuable for some things and you could do some relatively low resolution image processing, including, a car that could drive on the highway and it would literally drive around the highways around Carnegie Mellon. And that was part of the machine learning textbook examples. I, that great original textbook um, by Thomas Mitchell came out just in time for the first time I taught that course in fall of 97. And the name of the textbook is Machine Learning. In any case, the word of wisdom ar- around neural networks back then was that they can't be too many layers because backpropagation just doesn't scale. There's just some upper limit and it's, 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 they're just not breaking through that. So the main thing that happened since then was in part because the advent of higher computation ability to experiment more readily over larger data sets and larger inputs per row, or if you call it that, per example of, of the training data. Um, you know, all of a sudden, uh, it can scale and, and, uh, you know, there's new transform functions. They, they broke that barrier. And as a result, because it can have more layers and therefore do more sophisticated transformations, essentially be a a more adept, hairy, complex mathematical function in the end by adjusting all those weights, uh, well, backpropagation is effective. And with that, a higher Complexity means a, a larger number of inputs can come in. So you've got this scalable number of inputs. Every individual pixel of a raw high-resolution image is going in. So it's able to do these things really well. That's amazing. It's lending to all sorts of new capabilities um, and new applications of machine learning across industry sectors. So that's the good news. So here's the word of warning where I see this as a, the bottom line as a net overall effect is that the ratio of hype to value is unfortunately increasing. I don't mean that the value is not increasing, but that the hype is increasing even more than that. And that's bad because it will lead to disillusionment, uh, you know, uh, disappointment. Like in that movie, Fish Called Wanda, where, where Kevin Klein goes, he opens the safe and expects to see the money and it's empty. And he goes, disappointed. And that's what all the executives are going to say soon. <clears throat> um, so let's um, go through this list of four reasons, or four ways in which deep learning is actively, in my opinion, increasing the ratio of hype to value. Um, one is that because it's such an amazing um, technology, that the focus is just that much more on the modeling and technology itself. So the overall, my overall diagnosis of machine learning, both deep learning and every other method, is that the ratio is way too high on the technology rather than the value. 
right? So the the main event in rocket science is the launch, not the design and the building of the rocket. And machine learning as a community has is has let has yet to learn that lesson. Right now, everyone's so excited about the technology. The, the launch is relatively an afterthought. So this only magnifies the general phenomenon we're seeing, which is that newcomers to machine learning just want to get hands-on. They jump straight into the hands-on. The first thing they do is take a hands-on course. They download some software, maybe open source, what have you. They get some sample data, and then they just start working on it. And you're going to see an analogous process within organizations, maybe a data scientist who hasn't really done machine learning per se. They just want to get hands-on, make the models. They might get a kind of green light from their immediate manager. But what's missing is the organizational component, the overall project leadership practice that is a end, you know, forges a reliable and feasible end-to-end path to deployment, which means getting buy-in, understandable uh, understanding and input from um, executives and managers and anyone needed to actually green light and authorize the actual deployment, which means changing what the business is doing as an op- as a business, right? It's it's not business as usual. It's a change to those major operations, and that's the whole point. That's where the value happens. But that means we're not just doing some fancy new number crunching, but we're changing the business. So it's an organizational practice. um, And that's what we have to conceive of machine learning projects, not as a technical project, but as an organizational project that um, has technology as a key uh, component. So, you know, we talked in the first episode of this podcast about the new um, survey results that we had just seen um, uh, with a survey that I, I partnered with Katie Nuggets to perform, where we saw that most data scientists are saying only between zero and twenty percent of their models that are generated in order to be deployed actually get deployed. Um, major problem, and I would say that um, the ratio of, um, in my opinion, of deep learning models, in my speculation, the the ratio that actually get deployed the proportion that actually get deployed is even lower. So the sort of misconception is that because it's more advanced, it somehow is even more valuable intrinsically. But the intrinsic value doesn't never existed in the first place of a model. The model's only valuable if it gets used. Where the rubber hits the road, the actual deployment. And um, that deployment... Um, only comes with a prudent leadership practice with the right organizational process, not just a good technical process. So that's the first of four reasons. The second is that I would say, in general, deep learning is only increasing the hype around so-called artificial intelligence. So the term AI, so many, much of the time, it's just a synonym for machine learning, and that, that's probably okay. The problem is that it's, that's not discerned, it's not clear, and in more times than not, the word AI is actually misleading. It's implying the capability of technology or the direction of t- technology that's, that has no true basis at this time. So the idea that we're headed more towards um, general common sense reasoning, the, the general notion of AI is that the thing is intelligent, it reaches human level capabilities or is approaching it in certain ways, which intrinsically implies that it has inherent value. It's sort of a catch-all solution. It's a, it's a fallacy, uh, as, as uh, Rich Hyman puts it, it's a fallacy of there being a single solution to multiple problems. But no, any project that uses machine learning is still a project meant to solve one problem. It's focused on one particular deployment process, um, and it doesn't have that general capability. You know, and, and sort of hand-in-hand with the sort of AI hype stuff that's fed even more because of the fascination with... So what happens with deep learning is that that model is so much more complex and that kind of kind of goes hand in hand with the underlying narrative of ghost in the machine or the mystery of, of intelligence. You know, even the inventors of the algorithm can't... Um, you know, the model's still opaque and even the uh, most advanced experts can't necessarily um, uh, reverse engineer or understand what the model's doing or how exactly it works. 
Um, and that may go hand in hand with advanced capability. So it may be that the more um, complex the problem that you're trying to solve, the least likely we are at, as humans able to understand the, what the model does. Um, but it doesn't mean, uh, but we, we need to sort of wrap our arm heads around that at the same time, not buying into the quote AI narrative, uh, of it becoming somehow, um, a secret sauce or magical or, or intelligent in the human sense of the word, which is super subjective anyway. Um, so it's, it leads to hype in all, all kinds of psychological levels. And another way is because of something I referred to in a previous episode, uh, and, the accuracy fallacy and some of the things that this um, these models can do, deep learning models are extremely impressive and are indeed literally accurate, in both the literal and sort of conveyed sense of that word. You know, how is there a traffic light in this picture? It can do as good a job as a human for the most part, quite potentially better than a human. But for things like what's the sexual orientation of the person? Is this person a criminal um, in this picture? Um, these kinds of prognostications, which would require some kind of um, magic crystal ball, um, you know, we as humans can't do it with quote unquote high accuracy or high confidence and neither can a machine, but it's been purported as being quote high ac highly accurate. I call that the accuracy fallacy and we deconstructed that in a previous episode. Um, you know, and and then uh, another so on another level is that deep learning is where you're really starting to uh, in, um, see the potential for self driving or at least a very advanced driving um, uh, assistance, um, and and that that's quite amazing and very promising. I think it's going to take long to to pass the deployment, sort of analogous to what an organization grapples with with deploying machine learning. So too do we grapple as an or, as a society with the actual sense of uh, are we going to deploy these automatons, these very big, heavy robots with four wheels that we've until now been driving manually onto our streets amongst our citizens uh, fully autonomously? Sounds kind of dangerous, also very potentially valuable and life-saving, but it's a huge change and there's uh, a lot of obstacles on the path towards uh, general um, self-driving capabilities at large. So... I see there being a, bit, a really bad ratio of hype as far as there. This is about to happen. We're about to have self-driving cars. It should happen any month, any you know, this year, that kind of stuff. I'm I'm looking at more like twenty or thirty years, depending on how you define mass scale deployment. In my opinion, so I kind of see that phenomenology with the self-driving hype as pretty analogous to the general AI hype. Um, as far as we're going to lead, it's going to sort of reach singularity or human level, super intelligence, human level intelligence, and then super intelligence. It's, those things kind of go hand in hand. And so too, do they share the same core technology, deep learning? So um, anyway, there's a lot of levels to that. That was number two, the AI hype. Number three out of the four reasons that deep learning increases the ratio of hype to value is that the kinds of projects that you t that deep learning serves tend to be more speculative and exploratory. They're more on the research and development side. It's more about introducing a brand new operation rather than augmenting or improving or making more efficient an existing operation. So with traditional machine learning projects, um, you might use something, a traditional method, a decision tree, a log linear ensemble model, what have you. And what you're doing is enhancing enhancing an existing operation, such as in fraud detection, targeting of marketing, um, or credit scoring for financial credit risk. Um, whereas the kinds of things that we're going to do with deep learning is automate the operation of a vehicle or suggest uh, medical diseases to a, a healthcare practitioner from automatically um, processing a medical image. And these are new capabilities, so the path from now to deployment is that much longer. It's that much more speculative what's going to take before an organization and, and an institution actually um, embraces it. Um, so you're kind of <laughs> increasing the need for a very prudent, stringent, aggressive organizational pr um, practice, a leadership, pr um, strong-willed leadership with lots of foresight uh, over the overall machine learning project to get us hopefully to deployment eventually. Just that much more 
uh, needed on that side. And then finally, number four out of the four reasons that deep learning increases the ratio of hype to value is that, and this is probably the least of the four, but it's worth mentioning that the models themselves are more complex, and therefore there's that much more potential for uh, engineering challenges in actually integrating the model into the field and getting it deployed, right? So there's that much more potential for underestimating that particular step, the obstacles to it. Um, well, and, you know, sort of analogous to that, since my, my theme here as far as um, deployment challenges is that it's organizational, it's psychological, and we're trying to sort of get the, the business to accept it, embrace it, and actually green light its deployment. Um, and when the model's that much hairier, that much more opaque and difficult to interpret, um, that can also be a, an impediment. So with all those things in mind, right, um, that many more deep learning projects are going to sort of run up dry. They're going to stall. They're going to create a model that's quite impressive. And that model will never get deployed. So the organization never gets any actual active value from the learning machine learning project. Um, it, something I, I just coined a phrase off the top of my head, the nifty demo effect. So deep learning increases the quote nifty demo effect. You know, if I'm an enthusiast, I'm like, Hey, I have these raccoons that walk across my yard, but sometimes it's a neighbor's cat. And I want to put a camera out there and make a deep learning model that can discern between raccoons and cats. I could actually do that if I had enough extra time on my hands and somehow got the right data set and then set it up. I've got the camera on the front of my garage and then, hey, I can show my friends, hey, look, this thing does a great job and can generally discern between raccoons and cats. So it's a really nifty demo. And the reason it's so nifty is because there's this underlying feeling that you're um, tapping a great power and that you're... Um, and then the, the world's your oyster. The potential is so awesome. But um, the distance from that nifty demo to actually deploying it, what are you deploying it for? Are you going to have a, a, a thing that makes a, a noise that irritates the animal and makes them run away, but you don't want to irritate the cat? Well, what's the false positive cost to irritating the cat? Well, you might cause a problem to the cat's ears or it might its personality might get irritated and then your neighbor's mad at you. So are you going to actually de just detect cats versus va raccoons? There's no value. Are you going to deploy it and, and actually start uh, having some operation that tries to deter the animal if it's a raccoon but not if it's a cat? Um, that's a big step. And exactly the same thing occurs inside an actual company, <laughs> even more so taking that big step to actually putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so the demo effect, what I'll call the nifty demo effect, is that you can very quickly with this impressive uh, technology, get to a point to say, gee whiz, wow, look at this, and it plays a video game or what have you. But when you're going to put put it on the line and deploy it, that can be a very different thing. So what I see on the horizon is the next AI winter, and so do many other people. And it's not really a question of, of whether, it's a question of when. Um, very hard to forecast when. There's so many factors and dynamics play. Um, but I think that there's grow. this is a factor of growing pains and the industry's grow grown very much in a positive way with the advent of this core technology of deep learning and it's new, the new capabilities it offers. But the growing pains are that, Hey, that means we're going to have that much more work to actually start to make value of that technology. And I would say these growing pains are not yet actually being felt very much so that we're now on a wave of excitement but when we get a little more of a sober view, the excitement has waned and we're, you know, the next morning you wake up and you're like, well, that was a great party last night, but where are we right now? You know, we still haven't deployed anything. Um, so, you know, the lack of, val of, of uh, tangible concrete value in that way, is going to start to matter. <clears throat> so um, I think the best way to wrap up is, uh, just to address these two questions we have from our avid listeners. Here's the first question. Isn't MLOps a solution to this problem since it gets models operationalized? Isn't MLOps the solution to this problem since it gets models operationalized? Indeed, MLOps is a reference to operationalizing 
the models, otherwise known as deploying the models. And that's a, that's a, a, a system, a framework, and a set of technologies that's meant to help um, you, you know, manage uh, and enable the ability to um, keep models uh, in the right framework and context and actually get them deployed. However, I would say that, that and, and that, that's a big hot trend and it's generally lauded as, hey, we need to get business value, we need to actually deploy it and this is going to help us deploy it. And that's true and it may be a, a very important and necessary component to a machine learning project, but it doesn't address the main ailment. Uh, the main ailment, the root cause of the problem is not a technology limitation or a te- technical challenge, it's an organization and decision maker challenge. It's a management issue. It's getting the green light, getting everyone on the same page, right? Getting everyone to understand how we're going to operationalize it. What operations are going to be changed? What micro decisions of which there are thousands or millions every day are going to be informed and altered by way of the probabilities output by the model? Um, Does everyone understand why we're making that change? Do you approve it? Do you understand the way in which we're measuring the performance improvement that we expect to get? Um, and accuracy is usually not the right one. So there's a certain amount of ramp up and there's very much enlisting involvement, n- not only in the green lighting, but at all parts of the project of the overall machine learning project, uh, right down to, 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 to defining the dependent variable, preparing the data, um, you know, iterating, deploying every, everything. So that sort of lack of collaboration with the business side is, is very much part of what's missing and what can be remedied with the right leadership practice. All right, well, let's get now to the second and last question here. So how do we tap the power of deep learning and yet still actually deploy it? How do you tap the power of deep learning and still actually deploy it? So how do we get our cake and eat it too? How do we make use of this such such potency that we get with this new, more advanced version of machine learning, deep learning, um, and yet not get caught up in these four ways in which it can sort of actually contribute to excitement without contributing as much to value. Um, and the answer is really what I've been alluding to all along. We need the right leadership practice. We need uh, to start recognizing that machine learning as an organizational project as an endeavor by a company is not just a technical endeavor at all. It needs to first be seen as an organizational endeavor with a technical component. The focus needs to be on the launch of the rocket ship, not so much the design and building of, we need to design and build it, but the exciting part, the part of the value, the part that's going to really wow the audience and the executive is when you deploy it, when it actually starts making a difference in improving operations. So, we need to keep our eye on the ball and the difference between and, and you know without getting intoxicated by the excitement of the technology around the technology the core technology itself and keeping that clarity of view takes that much more effort and ha- and that much more discipline in the project management um, when we move to deep learning <laughs> 